Good afternoon. I'm spot on weather meteorologist Matthew Euler, and welcome to How the Weather Works training series. This is video part eight, and today I'm going to switch gears from the last video where we talked about the tropical areas. Now we're going to switch back to the mid latitude areas. Those middle latitudes encompassing the latitudes between 30 and 60 degrees and impacts quite a large amount of people. Very large population centers, very large cities, a very large amount of land masses within that mid latitude belt. So now we're going to reshift our focus back to the mid latitudes. And in today's topic, I'm going to cover a variety of interesting things. I'm going to start off with a refresher on air masses. I uh, will talk about the polar front theory and how these mid-latitude cyclones go through various phases, various stages of development. Uh, on this particular title slide today, I'm showing an example of a mid-latitude cyclone itself. And within this, you'll notice a lot of different um, arrows representing the circulation. Uh, area of low pressure in the northern hemisphere, the winds generally tend to blow counterclockwise around a low pressure center. And there's a lot of different air masses involved in the creation of a mid-latitude cyclone. And they play a large role throughout that mid-latitude cyclone's life. On this particular graphic, there's warm air, there's colder air. Uh, we have arrows showing the direction of the cyclone, the mid-latitude cyclone. Um, and then there's more cold air behind the cold front. you got cold fronts and warm fronts. And so we'll get right into the training, and I'm looking forward to going over this topic. It's very in interesting for sure. So let's first start with the review on air masses. Various air masses affect the middle latitudes. And what is an air mass? It's just simply a large expanse of air with similar properties, mainly the temperature and humidity characteristics throughout the vertical and throughout the horizontal of a specific air mass. They tend to form over large geographic source regions. Usually air masses form either over water, which is classified as maritime, or land, which is classified as continental, continental air masses. These are the different uh, letters that represent the various, or the different designators, I should say, that represent the various types of air masses that impact mid-latitudes. The first one, you'll see a large letter A. That is Arctic air masses, when you see the letter A. When you see this CT symbol or abbreviation, that represents a special type of air mass known as continental tropical. Uh, the one thing with continental tropical air masses is they only form during the summer season in the northern hemisphere. And they are, tend to be associated with the very hot air over the desert southwest of the United States, that area. CP, see the abbreviation CP, that stands for continental polar. MT is a maritime tropical air mass. MP represents maritime polar. And then E represents, the letter E represents an equatorial air mass. Now an equatorial air mass, that would be the one exception to the rule. I did say air masses that impact the mid-latitudes Equatorial air masses generally remain exactly in that area in the deep tropics over the around the equator. Now, there's also, in addition to uh, whether land masses form over land, whether air masses form over land, abbreviated with that C, continental, or over water with that lower M abbreviation representing maritime, we also have to look at how air masses change as they come out of their source regions. Um, so there are thermodynamic classifications as well when we talk about air masses. And they include the letters W, which indicates warmer underlying surface, and K, colder uh, air masses and underlying surfaces. So we have to consider that underlying surface over which an air mass travels. Uh, for example, an MT air mass is going to be one an MT air mass that moves over warmer areas yields MTW designation. So here is a review of the air masses. Uh, my main focus in this video is on the United States, uh, North American continent in general. Um, generally you can see uh, the various abbreviations again representing various air masses. 
Um, so in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific Ocean, uh, generally we see a maritime polar air mass dominating that location. A uh, CP, continental polar air masses, uh, these are very, very cold in the wintertime uh, for the United States as they come down from Canada. Source region is Canada, by the way. Now in the summertime, you'll have a cold front moving through, uh, let's say, the northern plain states and upper Midwest, and that may be affiliated with just simply a um, drop in humidity, not much of a drop in temperature during the summer with continental polar air masses. Additionally, we have maritime tropical air masses that generally form over um, the warmer waters of the Atlantic Ocean as well as the Pacific Ocean. And then in, in extreme cases during the winter time in the Northern Hemisphere, you can get a very, very cold, bitterly cold air mass coming straight from the Arctic into the United States, into, into Canada, and that is known as a continental Arctic air mass, very cold and dry. Again, CT air mass, I pointed this out, or I mentioned this in the last slide, this type of air mass is only observed during the summer season, and air masses, again, are going to modify as they move out of their source regions. They're going to move over warmer or colder surfaces, as well as land and water surfaces. Water, uh, for example, a CP air mass moving out over the North Atlantic Ocean uh, may very well transition from a continental polar to a maritime polar air mass. Um, so a lot of varying degrees of changes of air masses as they move out of source regions. Moving now into a discussion, as we go away from air masses, we work our way towards the polar front theory. We need to talk about jet streams and fronts once more. I have done previous uh, videos here in this How the Weather Works training series with more in-depth discussions on jet streams. But here's just a quick review of the importance of jet streams and these frontal boundaries at the surface of the Earth. Now, jet streams, they generally cause air masses to move away from their source regions. When you get meeting of two air masses, that's going to represent a great source region of potential energy due to the temperature gradient or difference between the air masses. Air masses do not readily mix as they are different in temperature, moisture content, or both. So when we talk about various air masses, we have to look at the temperature and the moisture distribution throughout the air mass. Um, and that will definitely have an impact as far as your density differences across a front. The boundary between dissimilar air masses is generally called a front, and the motion of air along the front determines whether or not a wave or area of low pressure will be formed along it. Let's now take a look at something very important, a very important concept known as a polar front theory. And this theory assumes the polar front serves as that focusing focal point or boundary between cold air masses in the polar regions and warmer air masses in the tropical regions. The interactions between these air columns produces the jet stream in general. If you look at the uh, bottom right hand graphic showing you the Earth, and again, this has to do more with um, kind of a review on the different distributions of the global circulation, the different cells involved. But my main point for showing you this is to show you that the polar front generally forms around 60 degrees latitude, generally in this area, generally in this area right here, 60 degrees latitude. And it is the separating line between the milder mid-latitude air and the colder polar air. So it's a convergence of air streams from the middle latitude feral cell and the polar cell when we talk about that global circulation pattern. Jet streams and the polar front tend to undulate. That's another big point I like to make. They move, they never stay fixed in position. They undulate and they shift position with the seasons. Uh, for example, in the winter time in the Northern Hemisphere, that polar front jet stream and the polar front itself they're going, that's going to undulate closer to the equator. It's going to move further southward in the winter season. In the summer season, both the polar front jet stream and that polar front tend to shift further north. Um, think of the polar front as, if you ever heard on TV uh, when the meteorologists talk about storm track, that's exactly what the polar front is. It's the general storm track. Now, waves of low pressure normally occur in the upper atmosphere. You get these waves that develop. And 
you know, in addition to areas of these, these troughs or lower heights, you also get these waves of higher heights as well, these upper level ridges. And they generally tend to develop from these undulations in the upper atmosphere, these waves. Long waves, which are mainly focused at the 300 millibar chart, or that level, possess a larger wavelength between, and you look at the wavelength, generally between 50 and 120 degrees of longitude. That's quite a large area. If I were to look at a map with latitude and longitude lines, um, extending from 50 to 120 degrees longitude, it covers a very wide area. They move generally very slowly, two long waves do. Um, typically two degrees of longitude per day in the spring season, and they're slower in autumn, and they generally have a retrograde motion possible, long waves. And what does retrograde motion have? What does that specifically mean? Retrograde means that the long waves can move back westward um, instead of going towards, you know, working their way from west to east. They can actually go from east and push back westward, and that's a retrograding motion. At any given time, there are generally three to seven long waves in the upper air flow pattern. So that was long waves. And we talked a little bit about these waves in my previous How the Weather Works training videos. So please feel free to look at those videos uh, previous to this one um, to get more information on various types of waves in the atmosphere. Um, the long waves, we have those as I mentioned, and now let's talk about short waves. Short waves are generally going to be showing up at the 700 and 500 millibar levels. 700 millibar being 10,000 feet above the ground and 500 millibar level being at 18,000 feet above the ground. Now these short waves are very important weather makers. Um, they generally can result from either the turbulent eddies within the jet stream or from upper air manifestations of vigorous surface convergence. Short waves are the upper level support for surface storm systems and for surface low pressure systems. These waves are embedded within a larger scale flow, these short waves. They move in the same direction as that flow, generally steered about by the jet stream. They move from a west to east direction and at a rate of 8 degrees longitude per day in the summer season and they move much more quickly in the autumn season. They can move as much as 12 degrees of longitude per day in autumn. Generally, short waves move quicker in autumn as well as in the winter seasons. They generally tend to move much slower in summer, for sure, um, when the upper level wind flow is not as strong. The jet stream, the winds are, are, are weaker in the summer season. Short waves are more numerous, by the way. There's usually 10 or more of these short waves at any given time, and they're smaller, much smaller in wavelength than the longer waves. So let's take a look at the various types of waves here with, this, with these particular graphics. Uh, let's pay attention here first to the upper left-hand graphic where we look at parts of a wave. I just want to get you familiar with parts of, of a wave. Um, so when we talked about long waves generally extend between 50 and 120 degrees of longitude, that wavelength. Wavelength refers to the distance between a wave crest to the next wave crest or I can use wavelength from the wave trough to the next wave trough, okay? So think of wavelength as a distance between the wave crest to the next wave crest, or from wave trough to wave trough, okay? That is a wave length. The wave crest is the highest point of a wave. The wave trough is going to be the lowest point of a wave. And the amplitude is going to be basically one half the vertical distance between the trough and that crest. Okay, that's the amplitude, that's vertical, um, half that vertical distance between the trough and that wave crest. And then this dashed line is just simply referencing that point at sea level. Okay, so as I mentioned about wavelength, I wanted to make sure and kind of point that out with this particular graphic, so hopefully you understand that better. Looking at the graphic here in the upper right, uh, these, this is a picture of the various long waves throughout the northern hemisphere. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, there could be as many as three to seven long waves in this upper air flow pattern. In this particular example, I'm showing you five distinct long waves. Okay, um, You see these long wave troughs here represented by that L, that's an area of lower heights. And then you have the long wave trough axes um, by this dashed line. But in general, across the northern hemisphere, in this example, we have five long waves. Okay.
And so when you're talking about the weather, you need to look at the whole hemispheric pattern and what is the upper air flow doing? Um, where are the troughs, long wave troughs? Where are those long wave ridges? And then embedded within these particular long waves, you actually have smaller scale wavelength disturbances known as those short waves, which tend to travel right through the mean flow here. Here is some examples of a long wave here on the left. Um, this is an example of a long wave trough um, in a long wave, another long wave trough off the west coast. And then you also have these short waves. As I mentioned up here, um, you generally have these dashed lines that represent little short waves that are basically embedded within this larger scale long wave pattern. Moving on now to the polar front theory. This is a very important theory in meteorology. It basically describes how an area of low pressure or a storm system initially develops and advances through its various stages of life. So I'm going to break down the polar front theory into these various stages and kind of just show you what, what's going on with the various air masses, with the frontal systems involved, and the whole process from the beginning of wave initiation to the occlusion stage. All right, so whether or not a wave will occur or develop at the surface is going to be dependent on the airflow at the front. In this particular example, by the way, I'm showing you a stationary frontal boundary. Okay? Cold air mass is to the north, a warmer air mass is to the south of the boundary. And in generally what you have happening when you have a stationary boundary, let me go ahead and draw it out for you here. Generally what you have is you have air that is moving parallel, the wind directions are parallel to each other, okay? They're moving in opposite directions. There's no turning in of these of the wind towards the frontal boundary itself. Uh, colder air to the north of the front in the northern hemisphere, warmer air to the south of the front of the stationary front in the northern hemisphere, and the air streams generally tend to parallel each other. You must get some type of force to get these air masses to turn in towards each other and get them into motion. Because right here, these dark style lines represent lines of equal barometric pressure, the isobars. And what you need, you got a lot of potential energy here based on the spacing of these isobars. Now, remember from a previous training video, I talked about the spacing of these isobars helps determine the strength of the pressure gradient. So the more of these you have packed in a smaller horizontal distance, the stronger the pressure gradient, the greater the potential energy. A stationary boundary initially begins the process of wave development. All right, so eventually what we have happening is we get some sort of cyclonic shear which causes wave development or formation along the stationary boundary. Um, cyclonic shear being a counterclockwise rotation of, you notice how now I have a warm front in the bottom diagram here, that, that red line with the semicircles on it, and I also have a cold front, okay? So now I have an area of low pressure that's developed along the stationary boundary. I now have the air masses starting to move towards each other. The winds are starting to move in towards each other. And what I have is warm air moving northward. Here, let me do it and draw it out here. So you have warm air moving northward like this, okay? And you have cold air moving in behind the area of low pressure. That area of low pressure is represented by that black L here. So in the initial phase, the shear, that cyclonic shear, and all that cyclonic shear refers to is this counterclockwise turning of the winds. That cyclonic shear, okay? In this initial phase, the shear is going to produce a warm front and a cold front, which serves as a demarcation between the polar and tropical air masses. So in generally, to the north of the low pressure system, to the north of the warm front, and to the um, north really to the west and southwest of the low pressure behind the cold front is where you have your polar air and then tropical air is located out ahead of the frontal boundary, uh, out ahead of the cold front. Cyclonic shear plus the tendency of air to generally converge or meet inward in cyclonic flow and then addition as the wind starts blowing, um, it's moving over the land which is that land is creating friction all combine to develop a low pressure region. So this is known as the wave stage. So we go from a stationary boundary, 
no area of low pressure, no wave of low pressure developed along the boundary. Then the winds start turning in towards each other. Cyclonic shear is there. Warm air moving northward, cold air moving southward. This is going to disrupt stationary frontal system. This is the initial or wave stage, uh, which starts to get the air masses moving towards each other. The warm air is eventually going to overrun the colder air ahead of the warm front. Um, it generally is going to move toward the region of lowest pressure, the greatest pressure falls. That's where the warmest air moves towards. While the cold air behind the cold front continues to drive the warm air aloft as it advances. Surface convergence continues to increase as low pressure continues to intensify. That area of low pressure is getting stronger, deepens. Eventually, this produces a central surface low, a closed isobar about that low pressure center on the surface. And so what we're talking about here, let me go ahead and draw it out. If this is the surface of the earth right here, okay, um, generally what you have is for a warm front, you generally have <clears throat> air that's going to gradually ascend colder air at the surface. That's what's happening when warm air moves in. You initially have colder air at the surface here, and then the warm air, because it's lighter and less dense, is going to move up and over the cold air at the surface. This is going to create a lot of clouds. It's going to produce more continuous precipitation. It could be rain. It could be snow. Um, but it's generally going to produce some sort of continuous precipitation as this warm air runs up and over the colder, more dense air at the surface. All right, and that's what we're saying here when we say the warm air overruns colder air ahead of the warm front. Um, and then the colder air is going to develop, generally gonna have it like this. This represents your colder air slope right here. This is the cold front. This is where the coldest air is located, okay? And with the cold air, what happens, Cold air, it's going to move in. It's going to stay close to the ground, the cold air, behind the cold front. Because it's more dense. And what's going to happen is this warm air is going to be lifted in the vertical ahead of the cold front. And usually what you have is a lot of showery precip. Sometimes if the air is unstable, you get thunderstorms to develop ahead of the cold front. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of show you some examples of how these air masses set up in relation to this developing wave of low pressure. Now, as that center of low pressure continues to intensify or get stronger or deepen, these lines of equal pressure, the isobars, these solid dark lines here, are gonna come closer together, and that close circulation around this area of low pressure is going to increase in speed and cyclonic vorticity. So now you're getting more um, stronger cyclonic curvature across the fronts, um, warmer air advancing ahead of the low pressure system, colder air coming in behind the low pressure system. Um, you've got a lot of turning in the winds here. It's getting stronger. The area of low pressure, the pressure continues to um, lower, the barometric pressure, as that low pressure gets stronger. Um, as these winds increase, by the way, the packing of these solid black lines, these isobars, as that wind increases, that's going to result in an increase in friction within the boundary layer close to the Earth's surface. And this is going to turn the winds toward that low pressure. This is known as the mature wave. Um, it's a mature developed wave phase and with a self-sustaining low pressure system now in place. Provided that eventually that surface load is not filled, but it's going to. There are braking mechanisms associated with these low pressure systems. And all a braking mechanism is, is nature's way to balance the strengthening of a low pressure system. It's, it's weakening, it's weakening factors. Friction is one of those braking mechanisms. As the winds increase, eventually the friction increases so much that it actually causes the central pressure to increase um, at the center of the low. So eventually, the cold front, which has a steeper slope and is faster, moving tends to overtake the warm front and either lifts that warm air aloft or overruns it. Flow originating, originating from that warm air sector now overruns the air mass ahead of the warm front, turns cyclonically toward the center of low pressure, wraps around the back side of the low and fills in behind the overtaking cold front. This wraparound flow pattern cuts off the central surface low from the wedge of warm moist air, 
And this flow then drives a circulation pattern around the surface flow. All right, so bear with me here. I'm gonna show you what happens here in a moment. But all we're getting at here on this particular slide is eventually, one thing you need to know about cold fronts is they tend to have a steeper slope. When we talk about slopes, if this is the surface of the Earth, a slope is that rise over run that I talked about in a previous training video, okay? Um, so if, let's say we have a slope like this, okay, now, this is the surface and we're going aloft or above the ground in this case. Now, compare the slopes between this, now this is the ground still, so compare the slope between this area and this area. Generally, cold fronts are going to have much steeper slopes, okay? compared to warm fronts. So just trying to mention, just wanted to mention that and kind of show you. Now, cold fronts tend to have steeper slopes, but they also tend to move much quicker. And eventually what happens is this cold air, the cold front eventually catches up to the warm front and will lift that warm air completely off the ground, okay? What it does is it tends to eliminate the air mass contrast, which that storm is relying on to continue being, basically to keep its energy going. Um, once you lose the air mass contrast, the warm air and the cold air start mixing into each other. You're going to lose the air mass contrast, temperature contrast, and that low pressure is going to weaken. All right, so the occluding stage features a deep surface low cutting off from the original wave. And when the cold front overtakes that and lifts that warm front aloft, the wraparound effect produces an occluded front. Cold and warm occlusions are the two types of occlusions that exist. The wraparound process will then lift the center of low pressure and separates the center of low pressure from the warm air wedge. So what's going on with an occlusion? By the way, an occluded front is represented by this purple line. It's represented by this purple line right here. This is an occluded front. There's two types. There's a warm occlusion and a cold occlusion. Um, but in general, what happens is the area of low pressure used to be down here in this area but it's now moved off to the northwest, and as it states here, the deep surface flow cuts off from the original wave, so it's pushing back towards the colder air aloft at the occluded stage, okay? And so what's happening is, is the cold front is much more quick, quicker as far as movement, and it catches up to the warm front over time, and then the warm air is lifted off the ground, forming this occlusion right here, okay? So now the occluded stage, is typically where you have the most intense stage of the cyclone before weakening kicks in. Now there are cases where you can get a triple point that forms where the occluded front, the warm front, and cold front meet. In this example here, the, the uh, triple point would be right at this point where the cold front, the warm front, and the occluded front meet. All three fronts meet at this triple point. Sometimes you can get a new center of surface low-level convergence or low pressure that could form at that triple point with cold air lifting warm air in advance of the cold front and warm air overrunning cold air in advance of the warm front. And this is an ideal location for secondary cyclogenesis or the development of a new low-pressure area. So if we were looking at this particular uh, graphic or, or, or weather map, surface weather map by NOAA, uh, you'll notice that in this location, this would be a prime area of triple point cyclogenesis or new storm development at this triple point. Um, we're starting to get colder air pushing in towards warmer air, warmer air moving in towards colder air, and that process is re-establishing re itself, the development of a cyclone. And so generally that is possible. This is the area to be looking for another storm system to form as this original low pressure storm system moves back to the northwest uh, into the colder air loft. All right, so the center of low pressure is generally tends to become lifted as we advance to the occlusion stage and isolated by the occlusion process from its source of potential energy. Um, you get more mixing of the air masses as the counterclockwise circulation around this low pressure intensifies, the winds increase, the pressure gradient is much stronger or steeper. And then Without that temperature gradient, again, this system starts weakening. The low pressure starts weakening. The central low lifts out even higher as continued occlusion pushes it further aloft. And generally with low pressure systems, um, they generally tend to fill from the bottom up. 
All right, that wraps today's training up on a couple different topics. We, we directed our attention back to the middle latitudes, and we talked about the importance of uh, middle latitude cyclones as far as their development, their life cycle, the different stages of a middle latitude cyclone. I started off today's training talking about the air masses again, um, generally what an air mass is, generally um, where they form. Um, one other thing I failed to mention here is that air masses like to form over flatter terrain um, where the air mass doesn't really move up and over and become modified by mountainous terrain. Um, so it likes flat terrain, air masses like to form in flat terrain with light winds where there's very little mixing of the air. Generally air masses form over either water become maritime in origin or land, continental in origin. Here was the designators for all the various air masses. Um, and as air masses move out of source regions, they either are moving over warmer or cooler land. As they move out of the source region, that's going to modify the air mass over time. So we use these other designators to designate that, W, warm, and K, cold. Here was an example of a maritime tropical air mass moving over a warmer area. That's going to yield an MTW air mass. If a maritime tropical air mass was to move over a colder land surface, it would be designated MTK. There was a review of the various air masses that impact the North American continent. And then I talked more about jet streams, um, how jet streams generally cause air masses to move from their various source regions. Um, eventually, jet streams lead to the development of their, their in conjunction. Jet stream is in conjunction with the polar front theory. Uh, with polar fronts in general, they exist along 60 degrees latitude, and they occur where you have low-level converging air from the polar cell and the mid-latitude feral cell. Mid-latitude westerly winds meet the polar easterly winds at the polar front. I talked about waves, just a quick review on waves, the difference between long waves, which are generally found at 300 millibars or 30,000 feet, have a very large wavelength on the order of 50 to 120 degrees of longitude, move much slower than short waves, and at any given time there are three to seven long waves in upper air flow, upper air ridges and upper air troughs, and um, these have a very important impact on our surface weather. Short waves, generally located in the middle levels of the atmosphere, um, generally talked about how they form, and then the importance of short waves is out ahead of short waves, you typically have that upper level divergence, which promotes uh, upward vertical motion of the air and clouds and precipitation typically develop in that case. Different port, uh, parts of the wave I described here in the upper left hand graphic. Uh, this is an example of a long wave pattern for the northern hemisphere. I'm generally showing you a long wave and short waves rotating through that long wave pattern here at the bottom two graphics. And then we talked about the stages of uh, waves of low pressure, how they develop. They intensify over time. Initially, you just have a stationary boundary separating two air masses. These, air, these wind air streams or wind streams are blowing parallel to each other initially. Then we get um, an upper level wave, one of those short waves to superimpose itself over the stationary front. And that generally tends to cause cyclonic shear to increase around a developing area of low pressure at the surface. Warm front, warm air moving northeast, cold air moving southeast. And you get a turning of the air or wind in towards the center of low pressure. And then with time, what happens is uh, warmer air is much less dense, moves up and over colder, denser air at the surface. That's your warm front. And then the colder air moves in behind the cold front. Um, with a steeper slope, cold fronts move much quicker than warm fronts and much steeper slopes. Eventually what happens, we get to this developed wave stage where the storm is getting stronger and stronger. Um, eventually what happens is that cold front it moves quicker than the warm front and it tends to overtake the warm front and lifts that warm air off the ground. Eventually this results in an occluding stage. Um, the initial portion, the beginning of the occluded stage is where the storm is at its most intense. And then as the occluded stage proceeds, uh, we end up getting uh, the air masses to mix out and so the air mass contrast, that energy for the storm is no longer available at the latter stages of the occluded stage. And then talking about redevelopment of a new area of low pressure, a wave of low pressure that typically occurs at the triple point. The triple point is the location where the cold front, warm front, and the occluded front meet. 
And then finally, the storm system is going to fill or that barometric pressure is going to rise within that column of air um, from the bottom up. So you will see the remnants of a storm system, a mid-latitude cyclone, um, in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. You'll still see it sitting up at, like, say, 500 millibars, while the surface flow may no longer be there. And that is our training for today. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, kind of doing back-to-back -back days on training. Certainly hope you're enjoying the, all the knowledge of the weather and how the weather works. And until next time, we got a lot more ahead. Until next time, take care and God bless everyone.